Hey guys, this is Kirob speaking and today we are back in Pro Cycling Manager 2021 with our parallel play along of the Tour de France 2021 and this is the very first episode, our preparing episode where we take a look at the overall route, the individual stages, some tactics and strategy as well as pick our team for this year's tour in the virtual world and I will be releasing an episode uh, before the real stage every day. So I think what we are going to do first is take a look at the route in general and then we go into the stages specifically and check out what kind of opportunities uh, await and what kind of pitfalls there are along the way as well. For this playthrough I'm going to use the World Database 2021, the recently updated one, as well as the um, actual start list of the Tour de France. So uh, there we go, loads a list of starters and now would be the time to check out the profiles and the uh, whole race in, in general. And it seems to be quite a, a classic one. This edition of the Tour de France is very much themed first week Bretagne and that has a few of the classic places in it. Mur de Bretagne of course and uh, also some hilly stages to start off the tour. No prologue this year so uh, what we can expect from the first two stages is that some kind of puncher, not a sprinter, will wear the uh, yellow and or green jersey. From Brittany we are quickly moving towards the Alps with just two transfer stages, uh, one flat one and one through the Massif Central and then we are in the Alps and that is just a quick stay there, not too many stages this time around. Um, move down the south coast and into the Pyrenees and that is where most of the action takes place this year and the Grand Final basically apart from the usual uh, last stage which is in Paris but before then there is another flat stage then a time trial and then we have Paris so a little bit different in the finish constellation there with this um, flat stage thrown in juicing it up for the sprinters that's for sure but now let's take a look at the stages individually the first stage is already one which will which just has chaotic written all over it it is a almost a classic in terms of uh, route. There are loads and loads of hills, most of them not too steep, uh, very rolling terrain. But because of this being the first stage in the Tour de France, this will be hectic. Lots of escape tries, there will be a high speed up front and probably a lot of chaos. This will be basically impossible to control and bring any kind of, of sense of calmness into it. This this is a stage where you probably could watch from the start and it would never get boring. But uh, it is finishing with something that is not the Mürbe and the Bretagne, but something that looks similar to it. And that is uh, quite the kicker there. Um, it is flattening off towards the sprint and that means any kind of sprinter or any uh, person who has a bit of a punch towards the end on the flat who survives that very steep first kilometer is going to um, be faring pretty well there. Is, isn't this like the perfect start of a tour for the likes of Alaphilippe? This is like dream start territory for, for those guys, the punchers. And uh, the second stage is quite similar. So uh, if you look at that, 177 kilometers there and uh, yeah, very very similar, some punchy climbs there towards the uh, the end and then uh, Mur de Bretagne. This has been taken on twice, we have it right there as well and then towards the finish. So that will be a killer stage too and with these two stages right up front I think we can see some um, surprises and a bit of chaos unfold with uh, especially ill-positioned riders that didn't get into a perfect spot in um, before the final climb and I'm talking about uh, yellow jersey favorites um, that then actually do lose a few seconds and uh, there is no in for real life that matters there is no free kilometer rule here for uh, those stages so that means that uh, <laughs> if there are crashes or the chaos which will 
inevitably ensue, uh, yeah, the favorites could lose a lot of time here. So it is all about being well positioned, don't lose time for the favorites, and be in the front group if you can. But that will be tough because these are all fresh legs chasing up the Mule Britannia and some really classic looking stage profile. All right, then, uh, well, there's the first proper sprint stages, stage three, four, and uh, five is a time trial. So I'm not going to say that much about the sprint stages. These are obviously sprint finishes. Uh, I don't think the escapees will have any chance that early on in the tour. And it will be big legs that are winning this. And then I'm looking at, oh, of course, Caleb Hume. So uh, yeah, and maybe Greipel can, can put one in there somewhere. This will be quite interesting to see from a game theory point of view. Because everyone knows Caleb Hume is the absolute favorite to win these. But if there is one favorite that is so heavily favored, then that means that he's at a, quite a disadvantage compared to his skills. So that could be interesting. But anyway, uh, stage number five is a somewhat hilly uh, time trial. And not a short one at 26 kilometers. This, by the way, is a theme here throughout. We have 56 kilometers worth of individual time trial. No team time trial this year. Then stage number six is between Tours and Châteauroux, the transport stage to the Alps, and that one is quite flat. Here in the game, there it is denoted as wind risk being high, so there could be some um, crosswinds and echelons forming and so on. It could be it could be an interesting play there. Uh, we shall see. But then comes a big, big kicker, stage number seven. Such an interesting choice from the point of route, uh, route planning. And that is an absolute classic of a race in of itself. This stage is absolutely brutal. It is 246 kilometers long and there are some big climbs, as in steep climbs, not, 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 not long climbs, but steep climbs towards the end. And it also ends in a kicker. With this stage coming seven days into racing, there will be some tired legs already, especially um, if the previous days don't turn out to be as uh, calm as the riders would have liked those flat stages. Early on, probably going to see uh, a bit of chaos there still, as the sprinters all want to have part of the pie but um, the 246 kilometer stage this really looks like someone who is a uh, yeah, classics rider a pure classics rider could have a chance in here uh, to steal the win and probably also get time on the favorites because I can't can't necessarily see the um, the tour specialists compete directly with the best of the best of the punches for the classics in this uh, this is a brutal, brutal stage. Uh, absolutely insane. So I'm really looking forward to that in real life and in the game. And uh, what do we have here? First mountain stage is uh, stage number eight. And not a small one. It's finishing in a downhill. There is no flat in the last, uh, flat bit in the last like 35 kilometers. So it is all down and up to climbers to decide this one. Looking at these climbs, they're, they're not without uh, gradient either. <laughs> if you look at this, this is crazy. It's just 8.4 kilometers long, the second to last climb. Uh, but remember, there's no flat bit here apart from the top of this one, like a kilometer or two. Um, this is 8.4 kilometers at an average of 9.5%. That is brutal. Uh, it's very steady climbing, but still. And then we have uh, an almost equally sharp uh, climb right up there after seven kilometers long with an average gradient of nine percent with a real sharp top so then a pretty big descent down to the finish uh, it's another 13 14 kilometers down to the line uh, so yeah definitely could be won by a downhill attack if uh, starting from a little group that goes to go together over the final peak and then comes a big pretty short mountain stage thereafter or well, equal length but lots of climbing once again some sharp climbs along the route 
and uh, yeah this one is definitely going to be try to be controlled by the favorites the previous stage of course also will have made uh, the favorites of the tour uh, quite anxious and probably we will see uh, proper control by some of the teams <coughs> jumbo wisma the train going uh, anyone maybe uh, may maybe that happens but um, I can see the same thing happening here and uh, this is a a slightly difficult to pace climb but it is not that steep so yeah it's an average of 5.7 percent but for 21 kilometers that's a lot then finally after a rest day we get into stage number 10 which mostly is flat it's not not that much happening here pure sprinter stage especially after a rest day i can't see this one going to escapees this won't happen then after that we have a long mountain stage and what a stage it is two times Mont Ventoux holy shit <laughs> this, this will be epic um, it is denoted here as wind exposed so we shall see how that plays but um, yeah Mont Ventoux is one of a kind of course um, we are going to the moon um, not not like cryptocurrencies but rather like the riders up up to the moon-like landscape of Mont Ventoux. 19 kilometers at an average of 8.1 percent and that includes that very shallow uh, foothill of of that climb uh, so it's actually a little bit higher average gradient it's relentless and once again this one is decided at the bottom which means that this is another opportunity for someone who is daring enough to really hammer it home in the downhill interesting very interesting this then is followed by two flat stages which both look like they are going to be decided by sprinters um i i can't can't see sprint teams not taking these seriously and letting escapees win they are too controllable for that this one quite wavy the uh, 12th stage but number 13 a little bit more hilly in some of the parts but the last 35 kilometers are just a little bit too easy uh, for the sprint trains to not catch the escapees i fear so so far not really a stage where escapees would have had much of a chance on paper um, this one stage number 13 is 221 kilometers long so massive and apart from those two mountain stages that we have taken a look at so far it has been pretty easy and this one is not going to change that just yet because we are now headed towards the Pyrenees and this is the first uh, stage that is getting a little closer there uh, what we have here is a pretty mountainous slash hilly stage that uh, does look like maybe it could be decided in a breakaway um, and I'm saying that because this is hilly and mountainous enough so that the sprinters will have a the pure sprinters will have a pretty tough day but the punches on the other hand are also a little bit like yeah there's not really that much for us in it because this final climb is still something like what would that be 14 kilometers away from the from the finish lots of downhill but it's it's not that steep it's not that technical so it would be um it would be possible for for the uh, peloton to catch up once again if they were trying to attack from the peloton itself this climb is not that long just 4.8 kilometers and it's only the first section the first two kilometers or oh, two and a half kilometers which are pretty steep yet i think this is a pretty interesting stage this will be a little chaotic once again and uh, that is then leading into the pyrenees and here comes the crazy four stages four mountain stages one after the other the first one of the pack stage number 15 is ending once again in a, no it's ending in a bit of a kick but after a uh, reasonably long downhill and uh, interesting once again uh, that one is starting with very steep little climb so potentially a uh, a place where punches uh, or well, slight outside favorites could surprise the main favorites with a bit of an attack and then sneak past them uh, to the finish 187 kilometers 168 kilometers 
Is it hilly? No, it's definitely mountainous. Uh, but these mountains are spread out a little. It's an interesting stage for sure. Slight kicker there towards the end. And I highly doubt that the sprinters will be all too keen uh, to um, actually go for, <laughs> for the win there. Uh, they likely will have been nuked along the way on these climbs because those are difficult. Even though they are not that steep for the most part. But 13 kilometers at an average of 6.6%, that is not for tree stumps. Tree stumps have problems getting up there. That's the next two stages. This one, absolutely crazy, Col de Porte. And that is very steep and very long. 16 kilometers of climbing after already having done two climbs that are almost equally steep and uh, quite challenging in themselves. Uh, that one has a long lead up of uh, kind of false flat terrain and 182 kilometers long. Definitely stuff for the favorites. And depending on where teams to choose to uh, open the throttle, this could see a lot of casualties. Then the final one, very short one. So don't let the, uh, let the profile, the stretched profile fool you. These climbs are very sharp. Look at that, 14, Col de Tumale, 14 kilometers at 8.3%. And then we have Luz Ariden at uh, another 14 kilometers of climbing at an average of 7.4%. That is favorites territory. Then we have a long, pure flat stage. And any sprinter that still lives at this point will have a good shot at uh, yeah, every, any sprinter who is not too terrible in the mountains, who still has some legs, will be fancying this one. This leads us to the final time trial. 30.6 kilometers. That is a lot. That's a lot of time trialing this year. Individual time trial, no less. And this one, almost entirely flat. So, uh, yeah. Time, pure time trial skills required. And then, of course, we have the classic that is the Champs-Élysées and well same route as almost always uh, we're doing a few rounds and finish it off after 120 kilometers so what does this profile tell you uh, one thing is that individual time trial this year seems to be quite important that is a lot of time trial kilometers the other thing is that after the first week or up to stage number five at least we're probably going to see a classics rider have the yellow jersey and not one that is a sprinter but rather one who is a puncher and then uh, what we are likely going to see is a first showdown on stage number eight or nine between the favorites a first proper test that is going to be repeated on stage number 11 but those two downhill finishes seem very intriguing to me so I'm looking forward to those. The proper test will be in the uh, stage 16 to 19, where the favorites really can show what they're made of. And the interesting part here is choosing when to burn all your matches. They do have another stage to somewhat recover before the time trial, which will be essential, of course. But at this point, the proper climbers will also have a word to say if they want to snatch victory from some of the favorites um, who don't have the luxury of burning out themselves completely. I think stage number 18 will be extremely hectic because of how short it is. Basically just two climbs right, right there and that's it. While stage number 17 is more controlled. And I think number 17 will be the main determining factor for who takes this tour. And why do I say this one and not the Mont Ventoux stage or stage number nine, was it? Yes, stage number nine. Well, I say that because this is the third week. The gaps will be the largest in this. And the climbs are some of the hardest too. So with this uh, kind of route, what do we expect from uh, the favorites? Or who are the favorites to win such a tour? I would say it's a classic tour rider, a really classic tour rider. It's not a climber um, because there's too much flat time trialing involved here. No mountain time trials where the climbers can 
put one over the the proper time trialers. And one more thing that I'm noticing is there are no real stages for breakaways to properly work. So they will certainly happen and maybe one or two will work um, unless there's a lot of chaos, which could happen depending on weather and so on. Um, but yeah, this seems like a, uh, a very polarized tour in that there is not that much chaos in the transition stages. We don't have uh, many stages in Massif Central, which usually is the spot where you really get some breakaways happening and succeeding. And uh, apart from stage number seven, I can't really see uh, where that could potentially happen. Yeah, okay, well, stage number 14 is another candidate. Oh, by the way, the second rest day is between stage number 15 and 16 in Andorra. So that is... Uh, one rest day between all those mountain stages. But now let's continue on and take a look at the teams. And let's take a look at the obvious ones for now and that will be of course Jumbo Wisma with Roglic. And is he a favorite? Yes, absolutely he is. Uh, is he the favorite? I think you could argue that uh, Pogacar is on the pretty much exact same level. Maybe even a little bit higher, who knows. Uh, Volt van Aert is absolute Superman, so you never know what is going, going to happen with him if he all of a sudden morphs even more into God and all of a sudden gets a top three finish in the tour or something like this. There's, it would, at this point, it wouldn't surprise me because this is just a, an absolute massively talented rider. But um, what other riders do we have? Uh, Ineos Grenadiers. Uh, who do you have? Carapaz, pure climber. Too bad at time trial. I don't think he has much of a chance this year. Because those 56 kilometers worth of individual time trial, or however many there are, are just too many for him to uh, have a chance against the likes of Roglic, who are just equally strong almost in the mountains, maybe slightly worse, um, as a purist but then also good at time trial. It is the UAE team which is hosting uh, Tajay Pogacar and this guy, yeah, he has a good shot at it. Certainly has a really good shot at it. Um, this will be a very interesting dynamic to see once again with um, Roglic. Will Roglic be able to get an upper hand this time around? Uh, we shall see. I definitely think that uh, Jumbo Visma has the stronger team where for as support for Roglic um, compared to uh, Pogaccia, especially with uh, Hirschi being a, kind of a wild card. He has been performing so well in those uh, breakaways. It was amazing. Um, uh, yeah, definitely very much looking forward to him uh, seeing him act like that again as uh, kind of a wildcard to take some stage wins. Um, but that also would mean that uh, Pogacar is alone in the race once again. So I'm not so sure if they do want to have the same thing, um, this, this same situation once again this year. One thing to also note is that with this year's route, there are a lot of pure sprint stages. Not so many stages where you would expect that you have some odd results with punches and so on, apart from the first two. And that means that I believe a normal-ish sprinter will probably have a good chance to take the green jersey. Will it be, once again, something like Peter Sagan using his smart tactics in order to get little points here and there and everywhere to finally end up in green? after the big stump sprinters are all out of the picture already on uh, the final stages. Well, who knows, could, could happen. And before I'm going to choose a team for this year's edition of the Tour de France, for the play along, I want to hear your predictions of who's going to win. What is your top three riders uh, for the podium in yellow? Who's going to take green? And hmm, who's going to be king of the mountains? And uh, yeah, I, I'm leaving out Young Rider jersey because for obvious reasons, right? Okay, cool. So are you ready? I'm going to choose 
quick step. The Koenig quick step. Yes, because what am I going to do here? Well, Alaphilippe deserves another shot at it, I believe. And such an interesting proposition. There are, there's a very decent sprinter in here, of course, Bellerini. And uh, he is not the fastest, but he is pretty versatile. Very good in the flat, too. And he is one who is, um, from his stats alone, going to last throughout the tour. So he might have a shot at a pretty good um, placement overall in in some of the stages, some podiums, hopefully. And then we have uh, Kaspar Asgren, and he is just a beast in the flat. Maybe he's one for some uh, surprise attacks um, and, of course, time trials. So he could potentially, if he uh, gets a good day, maybe snatch victory at some point. And then, of course, Alaphilippe. Such a strange candidate in here. He uh, does not really have the recovery to be effective all the way through the end. But he has such high stamina that if we are very careful with how we're handling things, that we could end up in a situation where he can get a top 5 finish. And if things go extremely well, maybe even a podium. So this would be the ultimate goal. And it's quite a challenge. And most likely he's going to have a pretty nice battle over the first week. And could see yellow there as well. Um, preferably, I would not be, if I'm going for the long haul with him, I would definitely prefer to not be in yellow in the first week because that would wear out the team a little more because you have to do some extra work. But other than that, I think there will be a really good battle between him and uh, Thunderball uh, in the first week. And then from there on, see how he lasts in the general classification. So that's what we are going to pick. This is going to be pretty awesome. This is our lineup. Just to uh, make sure that you are aware of the settings that I'm using here, I have set it to non-random fitness as well as I'm playing on extreme difficulty, which is the highest setting there. 1.1 multiplier for uh, the fall frequencies. And with that, I'm going to see you tomorrow when the Tour de France is kicking off and we are racing stage one of the Tour de France 2021 in Pro Cycling Manager as well. Hope you enjoyed and see you guys next time. Psst. Hey, hey you there. I heard you like cycling games. I think I got something for you here. The Cyclist Tactics is a turn-based strategy game in which you lead a small team of professional cyclists from humble beginnings to competing for the top of the podium in the toughest and most prestigious cycling events in the world. In the highly tactical, procedurally generated races, success comes about when superior decision-making meets careful resource management and planning. Teamwork is essential to keep your leaders protected, avoid peloton pulling duties, create lactate threshold crushing lead outs and to set up your lead rider in perfect position for the final dash. Guide your team's riders as they gain skills and progress from struggling eager novices to monument-winning superstars with a hefty price tag and more flaws than they started with. If you fancy Nuance Tactics, where decision-making is king, follow the game's development and try out the demo.